you must make a choice. You may take two small pieces of candy from this bucket and then you must leave. Or you may ask the artificially intelligent oracle for a full size candy bar. But only if your costume is good enough. What do you choose? Then you must take this relic and place it between the roses underneath him and await your judgment. The relic has been detected. Please look into my eyes. The oracle has deemed you are a dinosaur. Yes! And high five! five. I'm not sure to drag Good it. enough. Please return Give the relic five. to claim your reward. Oh, oh, take the skull. Bring me the skull back. <laughs> With the motorcycle horn. It's right there. Wait, where? <laughs> right there. Oh. <laughs>Ever since I got into electronics more than a year ago, it's becoming a tradition here that I do some kind of like over the top tech heavy Halloween attraction every year. And it's a time of year that I can do some kind of crazy engineering and 3D printing that has high value and like no consequences for failing. And now I've finished building my monster rat rig printer and all the other printers are functional. I decided to try doing some multidisciplinary project, including the AI. And honestly, the result even exceeded my own expectations. It all started when I printed this mask for fun and asked my family what they thought of it. They said it was super creepy, more than they expected. So I decided it had to be part of Halloween this year. But you know, wearing a mask and being creepy myself, that's, that's a lot of work. So I asked myself a question I ask like twice a day, which is, how can I automate this? Well, I did. And he's a pretty good looking guy if I don't say so myself. If, if I do say so, if I may say so myself, if he says so himself, I, I think you guys know what I'm going for here. All right, first let's talk about what the trick-or-treaters saw when they came up our driveway. First, I bought some of this PLA that fluoresces in ultraviolet light, and I printed a whole bunch of bats to hang from the tree, which went over a bunch of pumpkins that my kids pa painted with UV reactive paint. This is the first time I've played around with UV lights and UV reactive anything, and I have to say it was pretty stimulating. Also, now that I finished building my monster rat rig printer, I was excited to be able to print full-size skulls and faces, and I could do so in record time. For instance, I was able to print this giant skull in about nine hours, which is remarkably fast if you compare it to kind of a standard 3D printer with a standard hot end and nozzle. Yes, I know it's because I used a 0.8 millimeter nozzle. I didn't need to build a $2,000 printer for that. Once they step onto the porch, they go through a magic time portal, and now it's suddenly daytime, and this creepy face is staring at you and following you. This is made possible by that funky box on his forehead. It's a device called an Oak D from Luxonis. It plugs into a computer via USB like a webcam, but it is so much more than a webcam. The device actually has three cameras on it, which help it produce depth perception. And then it has a dedicated AI processing chip for running computer vision tasks. On the edge. I'll go into details later in the video, but the takeaway is that this camera made it really easy to track human faces in three dimensions so that this creepy face could do its creepy thing. Now let's take a look at this rat's nest on his neck. The heart of this project is the Raspberry Pi 4B, which is running the whole show. Yeah, that's a real Raspberry Pi 4B. I bought it a few years ago, and now they're basically impossible to get. And I was nervous the whole time that it was going to get smoked by some wiring mistake or something, but I was careful, and I got lucky, and it survived. But now I'm nervous that I have a wildly valuable Raspberry Pi, and now my house is going to get burgled. Burgled? Is that a word? Hey, future video editor Alan, can you check that burgled is a word and put the answer, like, right around here somewhere? Awesome, thanks bro. The 3D printed face and OakD camera combo are moved around by two servos that control the pan and the tilt of the face. Out of sight in the upper right was a motorcycle horn hanging about adult ear level, which was managed by a relay using GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. And when the pressure plate is triggered at the end of the sequence, it closes the circuit to the horn for 0.4 seconds, which gives it a nice jump scare I know this was kind of cheesy, but I had the pressure plate and motorcycle horn from last year's Halloween when I did the spider drop. You can see a video about that from last year. And they were both quality parts worth trying to recycle. Even though most things ran on five volts, the best five volt adapters that you plug into the wall are only three amps, sometimes only one to two amps. If I cared about running this thing after October 31st, I probably would have gotten a proper five volt power supply that could do like 20 amps. But instead I just went with the jankiest solution possible and sidestepped the whole issue by using cheap extension cords and giving everything its own plug. 
Within Fusion 360, I first modeled the square post on my front porch and imported a length of 2020 aluminum extrusion as a McMaster car component so that I could kind of start getting everything oriented. From there, I was able to design this mounting bracket which wraps around the post and can be held up by one of these monster zip ties. And you know how much I love zip ties. It also has a hole in one side and a slot in the other so that I could mount the aluminum extrusion to it, but it's still adjustable so I could decide on the exact angle later once I got it onto the porch. Next, I downloaded the STL of the mask, which was designed to be worn on a face and even has holes in the sides for straps, but I needed to automate this. I needed to mount it. So I imported into Fusion 360 and started adding the mounting features like the crossbar, which will attach the servos and mounting holes for the eyeballs. And then of course I had to design a way to actually mount the camera to this whole thing, including cutting out some slots in the forehead, which allow the camera to sit forward a bit more and blend in with the face more. Over here, I needed a mount for the Raspberry Pi along with some zip tie cable routing. It uses one of my favorite 2020 aluminum extrusion techniques where I import a model of the aluminum and then add a slider to the part that fits the aluminum T-slot channel with a little bit of clearance. Then I add some through holes right over the channel and install some heat set inserts so that I can thread an M3 thumb screw all the way through to the inside of the channel. Once it's in, it's only a quarter turn to tighten it down or loosen it and slide it around again. I had a couple toy servos and a pan tilt mount from Adafruit, and so I just took some approximate measurements and assumed that it was just, I was just gonna like plop it in there. But my dreams were shattered when, after adding all this stuff to the face, it became super heavy, especially with that beefy camera, and those little toy servos didn't have a chance. That forced me to upgrade to standard servos, which could handle the load, but then I couldn't find a pan tilt mount that had the right geometry to fit this structure. So I ended up having to import servo models into the project and design a custom pan tilt mount for them. And stupidly, I imported servo models that didn't have the wires modeled in them. So twice I ended up printing parts that didn't have room for wires. It just didn't fit. I got it eventually though. By the way, I know this thing is not a robust mechanical design because the servo arms are supporting the entire cantilevered weight of the face in the camera. You can see from the close-up pictures that it's definitely straining under the load. The servo arms are just not meant to hold that kind of weight. So this design probably wouldn't last in the long term, but it only had to survive a week of testing it and then Halloween itself, so I gambled that it would make it. Remember when I said everything gets its own power cord? Yeah, about that. When I wired this all up and tested it the first time, I accidentally left the breadboard power floating and its behavior was both hilarious and super creepy. But more than creepy, it turned out to be super interesting too. Because I confirmed that the erratic behavior was definitely linked to the dimmable LED lights on my ceiling. Changing the dim level of the lights changed the way the servos were freaking out. Which is a very strange relationship since the lights are on a different wall circuit than the plugs for the Raspberry Pi. So here's what I think happened. I have two servos and a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is powered by a wall adapter providing a stable 5 volts. The servos are controlled by the Pi sending 5 volt pulses over its signal wires. However, the servos also need power to work, but they draw a lot of power and if I tried to do it through the GPIO pins, it would definitely burn out the Raspberry Pi. So instead, I got a second power adapter to provide a stable 5 volt to the servos. But with nothing more, this setup only guarantees that the voltage between these two wires is 5 volts and these two wires is 5 volts. Unless you combine the grounds, they're floating, which means they don't have the same reference I discovered my issue because I measured the voltage between both grounds, which should always be zero, but instead I got like one to two volts. Thus, while the Raspberry Pi is sending out signals that are five volts higher than its own ground, it's only three volts higher than the servo's ground wire, which is sure to be confusing when the circuitry is expecting five volts, but only sees three volts. Then, when the flickering ceiling lights were illuminating the camera, which was hooked up to the Pi over USB, it must have been creating some kind of electrical noise on the Pi's five volt line, which was then greatly amplified due to the floating ground reference. The solution? Just add one wire to combine the grounds. Each power adapter is just pushing its own red wire 5 volts higher than its own black wire. So as long as the grounds look the same for all the power supplies, then the plus 5 volt lines do too. With all that done, I officially had a boring, creepy face. The camera was hooked up to the Pi, I could SSH into it over Wi-Fi, and I confirmed that the Pi could read the pressure plate, trigger the horn, pulse the servos. But there was no logic or AI to do any of it yet. And I had only a week until Halloween. I honestly did not know until the morning of October 31st if I could pull all this off, but the software and AI stuff is my bread and butter, so I rushed into battle with excessive overconfidence. And well, obviously I pulled it off. The Oracle has the... You are a pumpkin. Oh, a pumpkin? Well, you know, mostly pulled it off. 
There were two main goals. The first one was to use the software face tracking to create a control loop to have the servos try to keep the face and the camera pointed directly at the closest trick-or-treater. The second one was costume identification, which was both a stretch goal for the project, but also one which I had a really cool trick up my sleeve to pull off without even training a model specifically to do it. So first, let's talk about the elephant in the room the elephant on his face, that crazy awesome camera on Creeper's forehead. A few years back, OpenCV, which is one of the largest open source computer vision software projects, teamed up with a hardware manufacturer called Luxonis to design this beefy camera, which had two killer features. They ran a Kickstarter for it, which ultimately raised 1.3 million, $400 of which came from me like nine seconds after I discovered the project. I was so excited about this project, I couldn't get my money in fast enough. And my reward was I got a couple of these cameras when they finally started shipping them. But then they were just sitting on my shelf for a couple years and it wasn't until now that I actually found a good use for them. Luxonis released two primary models of this camera, the Oak One and the Oak D. The D in Oak D stands for depth and it's because the device actually hosts three cameras. The middle camera is a high quality 4K color camera and the two stereo cameras on the sides are low res grayscale cameras and their only purpose is really just to have slightly different viewpoints that is used by the onboard processing chip to compute a depth map of the scene, which it then can overlay on the 4K video stream. So the video that you get out of it has four channels instead of the standard three. You get your RGB red, green, blue channels from the 4K camera, and then there's an extra depth channel that supplements each pixel with the distance from the camera. Now, the first time you look at the depth channel, you'll be surprised by how noisy it is. You're probably not gonna put too much confidence in the depth measurement of one pixel on a given frame, but when you aggregate over regions of the image, such as where faces or other objects of interest are detected, it's actually not too bad. The second killer feature is that chip that does the stereo depth calculation. It's called a Myriad X chip by Intel, and it's actually an accelerator for all kinds of computer vision tasks, not just the stereo depth processing. For instance, the first sample script I ran when I got this all hooked up was an edge detection module. If you're familiar with image processing, you know that edge detection uses a lot of expensive convolution operations, and especially on a very large image, it takes a lot of time. Even though the output has a couple seconds latency, the whole thing is able to keep up at a full 30 frames per second. Of course, more interesting to most people is not the edge detection, but the AI processes that you can run. Now, some might ask, why is this such a killer feature? And I'll tell you, it's because you don't need the camera to be hooked up to a beefy computer in order to run these computer vision tasks. And if you have multiple cameras, you don't need to organize and manage all these video streams and AI pipelines. Instead, and this is crucial, the camera does the processing and simply makes the results available to the host computer. So if you're running a face detection model on the camera, the Raspberry Pi can access the original color RGB 4K video, the depth information that's overlaid on it, and the host can query bounding boxes for each detected face or object without ever having to run any of the AI itself. This is crucial for portable projects because as powerful as a Raspberry Pi 4B is, it's probably not gonna be able to keep up with doing all this AI stuff on top of managing everything else. This is exactly what edge computing is. In this video, I touched on just about every aspect of the Creepy Face project and I had so much fun doing it, but I didn't go into much detail on the way I implemented the software and the AI parts. In the second video, I'm gonna show you how I actually hooked my code into the camera and go over the costume identification AI pipeline. There was actually some serious software engineering going on here. It included a server with an NVIDIA 3090 GPU sitting behind a REST server that was processing costume identification requests from the Pi. Not on the edge. I even output these cool results visualizations to show the participants the top five AI guesses and scores and, you know, show off that there was actually like real AI going on here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss the second one and all the other ones I have in the works. And let me know in the comments if you have any other ideas for how I could improve this creepy guy, either for the next Halloween or how I can use him without having to wait a year. You know, maybe I should just leave him on my front porch and let him harass Amazon delivery guys. In the description down there, I've included some affiliate links for the Oak cameras and a link to their new Kickstarter, which is a robotics project using Oak D cameras as its vision system. It looks like a really exciting project. I haven't really had time to dig into it yet, but I'm definitely going to be contributing to that and looking forward to what they do next. If you have any inclination to buy one of these awesome cameras or donate to that Kickstarter, it really helps me out and it supports a really awesome product and companies. <laughs> and finally, I included links to all the 3D models I used in this project, including the ones I designed myself, like that mask with the mounting features and the pan tilt parts for the servos. Thanks for watching. Sorry kid, the AI won this round. Better get used to it.